the kind of person who um, has very, very strong emotional experiences. And so when I'm happy, I'm often super, super happy. I think that in my personal life, um, um, in my personal life, my life with my husband was incredibly happy. That's not to say it wasn't difficult. <laughs> um, I think the struggle to to get a, to know another person over a long period of time is a really profound struggle. But to have that understanding with another person it brings immense happiness. So now, since um, my partner has been gone for six years, I have really happy times um, remembering. Like today, and when I arrived in Hong Kong, I didn't remember how many um, experiences we had here together. So when we, would, when we came here my first time, um, I came to understand, and you know, personal habits like drinking milk tea, <laughs> drinking nai cha, and preoccupation with food and these kinds of things. So in my personal life, I've had a very happy um, and very eventful partnership with a really wonderful guy. I think um, also my sense of happiness um, is often more like a sense of, of having accomplished something. And I think it is connected to a service ethic. Um, for example, these days I can truthfully say that some of my happiest times are gardening. And that's because, and I can show you the pictures, I was able to freely plant and cultivate something beautiful um, that everyone enjoys and that is a natural practice. Um, when I'm in that garden, uh, I feel connected to, actually, it's sort of strange to say this, but I feel connected to my father. <laughs> I had a tumultuous relationship with my father, very, very difficult relationship. He was a farmer, and so when I think of the happy times with this man, I think about learning gardening or raising vegetables. Um, now I don't raise vegetables, I just cultivate flowers, but I also cultivate um, flowers I knew he liked, like canna lilies were one of his favorites. So I make sure to put canna lilies into the garden. So I would say that that um, right now in my personal experience, um, the peacefulness of um, being able to um, do simple things that um, do not require permission, they don't require recognition, it doesn't matter who the garden lady is. Nobody cares. <laughs> the garden lady loves the garden. That's all. Um, these are sort of very happy moments. Um, I think that um, I remember the first time I was uh, emancipated from my family and this is very harsh to say, but I was very eager as a young person to be legally emancipated from my family. And I, um, as you know, I started, I dropped out of high school and I started college when I was 16, and I really didn't like it at all. But I was only 17 when I left home, and so I was legally bound to part of my family. But my parents said that since I had fulfilled their expectations, by going to college and finishing my, uh, my high school diploma, um, that they would let me go. And I remember the happiness, incredible happiness I had in this small room <laughs> that 
I rented. It was just one room. I got a job at um, the San Francisco Fish Farms, which was a small factory in East Palo Alto across the freeway from where I grew up in Palo Alto. East Palo Alto was black. Palo Alto was white. Um, and so every day I would hitchhike. In those days, hitchhiking was very normal. I would hitchhike, get, get a ride over the bridge, and um, work as a um, what was called, um, I, was, I was the person who boxed up the product and sent it out. Um, ha having independence and enough money to get by and workmates, um, it was a really happy time <laughs> in my life. Um, I think right now, today, in responding to your question without really thinking much, it's interesting to me that these are very quiet very private, happy forms of happiness, very, very simple. And how did you get into China studies? That's and much easier. Traveling all the time. <laughs> or maybe you might want to talk about some of the main turning points in your life. But being emancipated and having your own room is yes. important. It was. And um, um, I think. I think I'd like to talk about how I came to be involved in, um, in Chinese affairs um, because it was a tradition in my family. So um, uh, my father's name is Claude Abner Barlow and he came to uh, China in 1947. He came with the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Association which was a left-wing United Nations project which um, was involved with farming, agriculture, and peasantry. Now, my father came from that kind of background, and he sought out this volunteer activity. My father did not talk very well. He wasn't very expressive. But I understood later why this project was so important to him. In any case, he, he went to China, and um, it was a very tough time there. So he, when he told stories, it was mostly about corruption in the Kuomintang government because their, their, the volunteers were housed with the, with the nationalist government. Um, and he was, like most people of that time, were horrified by the, um, the extreme poverty and then the way that the government behaved. Um, I also found out much later that he actually wanted, <laughs> you know, it sounds kind of crazy, but he wanted to go to Yan'an. I found a, a letter, which apparently my, my uncle has, um, saying that he was trying to find a way to go um, to see the communists. Um, he never was able to do that, but apparently he did have a relationship with someone who was going to help him to do that. Now, my father went on the same um, airplane as William Hinton did. So he met Hinton there, and he had funny stories about, about Bill Hinton. Um, and I always wondered what would have happened if my father had stayed. <laughs> but my father got kind of sick with, I think, dysentery of some sort. And so after 12 or 13 months, he returned, and my parents got married. Now, why was my father interested in China particularly? Because his uncle, Claude Heman Barlow, um, after whom he was named, that man was a medical missionary. So that man um, was stationed in Shandong province for about 20 years. Um, and this is the famous story that my father told me to kind of get me hooked <laughs> along with the revolutionary stuff, was that Uncle Claude um, worked on the schistosomiasis worm paras or the snail parasite. He became very interested also in rural uh, conditions and particularly in this infectious disease which was crippling people who worked in rice cultivation. So um, he, he worked in China, then he lost his religion. Um, he, he fell out of his faith, he lost faith in God, but he continued to be very interested in public health. 
So he, um, this is a family story, he inoculated himself with some of the disease to bring it back into the United States. And he did research, um, I don't know exactly where, someday I'll find out, um, before he and his family went to Egypt where he continued to work on this disease. I met him once um, when he was 95 years old um, and of course I was very much influenced by these stories. So um, that was sort of the family reason why I would have a, a reason to be interested. The second reason um, was that because my father and mother were um, very adventurous people, they were, for the period, they were extremely left-wing, <laughs> to the point where my father got into trouble um, with local authorities because he had come to, you know, he went to China, he must be a communist. And there are several other stories I'll tell, tell about that. But when my father finally my father and mother settled down in Northern California and got my father got his tenure. Then he started organizing teachers. So he got involved with a radical teachers movement and somehow they managed to create a program for teachers to go and live in Japan in 1963, uh, 62 and 63. Now this was partially funded by the school district because Palo Alto is a very wealthy place. And the reason they were sent was to create um, teaching materials for students. So there were 12 teachers selected and um, 12 families, um, one of them African American, which was really unusual for Palo Alto, um, men teachers and women teachers and their entire families um, went to Japan for a year. And I was 12 at that time and turned 13. Um, I learned Japanese very quickly and served as the translator for my family. Um, and we, we had a lot of adventures there. But what it taught me was um, to feel comfortable. Because as a child, we, we just wanted to make friends, you know. <laughs> just want to have friends and hang out and learn how to be like other people, you know, not stand out too, too much. Even though I was very, very tall, already very tall and uh, very blonde. <laughs> um, so when I started thinking about college, which was much later, um, I thought, well, you know, we have this family tradition of, of Chinese radical politics and um, although I, I learned a lot in Japan, I feel physically uncomfortable because I'm so big. So I think I'll study Chinese. And that's how I made up my mind. <laughs> now, that's sort of the personal little story, but the big story also was that at that time, this is the 60s, so um, in California, there was cultural evolution, and um, it was just part of everyday life. It was not considered unusual or foreign in some ways. When the Black Panther Party is handing out little red books, um, and people are opening kindergartens or public gardens or um, using Mao Zedong, you know, to, to develop social movements. My stepdaughter, for example, um, Lydia Lowe, was um, part of the, um, it was a movement that started in those years, the Le League of Revolutionary Struggle. Now this league was an underground secret organization affiliated with some faction I, I never knew um, in the Chinese government. Since then, of course, she came, came into democratic politics and is a labor organizer. Um, in Boston Chinatown. But my point here in telling this story is that this was not an unusual um, sort of set of goals and habits. It was very much a part of being in San Francisco and the Bay Area at that time. So it made per perfect sense. Now I was, I think, the only white girl <laughs> in Chinese class <laughs> because most of the students <laughs> were Cantonese speakers who wanted to learn Putonghua. So that was also quite an interesting experience for me. But there were student movements, of course, going on in my campus. Um, my campus, San Francisco State University, had been the location for the Third World Student Strike, which happened, as I recall, before 
the um, free speech movement in Berkeley. But it was focused more on the national minority issues and racial justice. Um, so it was it was really a very violent confrontation. So when I arrived to go back to school, um, uh, there were still police, mounted police horses on our campus. And um, it was kind of frightening. Um, but um, I then got really interested in studying Chinese. And um, I found that um, I was able to read, of course, um, uh, after a number of years of study, and I could read, um, uh, I became very, very interested in uh, Chinese women writers. So um, it opened up a really interesting pathway for me. Um, and I, I was supported in this by a whole, you know, many, many people who just went on to live ordinary lives um, and still probably do very similar things now in the Bay Area. I know. So from, from my student years, I, um, I had already put in a lot of effort to, to study language. And I thought, well, I think, I think I'd really like to do a PhD. So um, I started that. And you know, it was not a good time to do a PhD. No time is a good time. Um, but there were simply no jobs at all. So I was extremely fortunate at the end of my studies to find a job at University of um, Missouri in Columbia. Um, and after that, I moved back to San Francisco State as a professor of history and then on to um, University of Hawaii, where I taught in women's studies and then in history, and now I've come. I, I my current job is at Rice University, where I teach Chinese history. Um, yeah. Are there other things you would like to know about this oh, story? So many <laughs> it's easier for me to respond to questions. Yes, but then, um, well, being a leftist in yes. the fifties was difficult. So it was, must be, have been very difficult for your father very. and for the family. Very, very difficult. Also, um, my father came from this rural, religious, um, kind of um, traditional American left, like um, Wobblies. You know, they were rural um, progressives. And this is in the middle part of the country. This is Wisconsin. So there's a progressive, there's always been a progressive movement of farmers in this, in this region. That's what my father came out of. That's understandable. My mother, on the other hand, <laughs> is the daughter, the granddaughter, and the great-granddaughter of rabbis. So she's Jewish. Now, um, their story was that um, my great-great-grandfather became part of the Reformed Jewish movement in Europe. So they were Dutch Jews. And they were sent, um, my great-great-grandfather, no, my grandfather. My great grandfather was sent um, to San Francisco to set up the first Reformed Jewish temple, or at least that's the family story. We found out later he was a bit of a fraud, <laughs> but he was a really important fraud. <laughs> anyway, um, he had a number of children, and my grandfather was one of them. My grandfather was also a Reformed rabbi. Uh, now, these people were Zionists, flat-out Zionists, but they were leftists as well um, in the sense of F F Franklin Delano Roosevelt leftism. So they were, were left liberals and um, socialists. Um, my grandmother's sister was a socialist and a labor advocate and a birth control advocate and a labor lawyer for um, the Jewish women's, um, there was a, uh, a union for tailors and seamstresses, and she started her career that way. So there was always, in both families, these very traditional American left-wing kinds of things. Well, these two people met, and they weren't supposed to get married, but they did. So the Jewish side was horrified. Um, and there was a lot of bad blood from the Jewish side. The <laughs> Christian side thought that the, my mother was the Antichrist. They literally thought the Jews had killed Christ. And so my father was marrying an Antichrist or a killer of 
Christ. So you can imagine that this was not a comfortable situation. So my parents <laughs> decided to um, take their dream to the West Coast and get away from their families. Um, they, they decided to become school teachers. Now, um, I think, I didn't realize this when I was younger, but I think probably that my father um, was as close to being a communist as you could get in those days. Um, one, one incident in the long story of, of this family, um, I recently reread, and he, he, um, he and my mother eventually had four kids on the road, so we're like drifting around from job to job with all these children and no money. Um, so he, he got a job in Lodi, which is a very conservative grape industry area, at the high school teaching science. And when Sputnik went up, he proposed to the high school students that they form a Sputnik club and have fun trying to figure out what um, space travel was about. That was interpreted by the school as communism. This is during the McCarthy era. There were already letters in my father's file about his predilections. Um, and so it, it was written up in the newspaper and they're really interesting articles because Mr. Barlow was accused of being a communist and he was told that if he and his club shot off a rocket, and I think it was a water rocket, that he would be fired. Well, you can't say something like that to a man like my father. <laughs> so each article is about how he's getting closer and closer <laughs> to shooting this thing off. <laughs> so he did it and got fired. <laughs> and we had to move. And that's when my mother, who was equally radical, um, said to him, this is over now. I'm taking my children to a place where they can get a decent education and you don't get into trouble all the time. So that's when we, we, meant, we went to um, Palo Alto. But as soon as they were secure, they began this pattern of left outreach. So in my childhood, um, my parents made a huge issue of racial justice from the very beginning. And so we, my father and mother told us, you are not going to grow up in an all-white environment. We are going to make sure of that. So they did all kinds of funny things to make sure that didn't happen. <laughs> um, this is what my sister refers to as our socialist childhood. So we uh, hung out with the real communists um, who, who were teaching in the schools, just like the McCarthyites thought they were. And one of my favorite teachers was actually a member of the CPUSA. Um, but also leftists in general, and Quakers. So the Quaker ethic is also part of my background. The Friends Service Committee was very, very important um, uh, for social life when I was a child. And as the social movements in, in the Bay Area began to pick up steam, my parents got very involved. So they were co-founders of the Peace and Freedom Party in our part of, of, of um, the Bay Area. And by that time, I had left home, but they were very, very active. My sister and my parents got involved in desegregating the high schools um, that we had gone to um, and uh, the student strike at that high school. By that time, of course, I was gone, long gone. But this was my family tradition. Now, um, because it wasn't until much later that I realized this is a rather unusual background. Um, I would meet people, for example, people in left-wing movements in the academy, um, and I would hear them talk about how they came to consciousness or conscientized, and I would think, oh, I wonder what that's like, <laughs> that you have to learn this, um, and that's why I feel enormously grateful to my parents for making sure that um, the music that we listened to was progressive music. <laughs> My mother talked constantly about foreign leaders, politics, left movements in the world. That's what we talked about. So I have this whole backlog of names in my head because my mother indoctrinated me into, into knowledge of the world. 
and consequently all four of us became um, uh, became service oriented in that respect. I'm the only one who who went through the de the certification process and became a professor, but all three of my sisters um, work in various ways in um, social improvement schemes of one sort or another. <laughs> yeah. Um, did my father suffer from that? Quite a bit. I think he was quite alienated. Um, I think that in retrospect, um, he was also, both of my parents were um, um, non-conforming. So um, while they were very much shaped by, by the Midwest and norms uh, of their generation, they also tried their hardest. Um, to to overcome um, well the religious issue for example that just never became an, it it was a huge issue outside of our family and a non issue inside our family um, I think that he was both of my parents really um, be, because being a left person. Um, for the first, say, 15 years of their marriage was very difficult, particularly in the areas that they lived. Um, I don't know what they, I don't know how they coped, quite frankly. I know they wanted to have adventures and so they wanted to take us into the world, the larger world. We also traveled within the United States quite a lot. Um, but it, I don't remember that they had a close community of friends um, particularly and I'm, that might that might be a consequence of their politics. So were you the youngest? I was the oldest. You're the oldest. I am the oldest. So how did your parents take it that you left home at 17? They were not so happy. Yeah, quite frankly um, they made a huge mistake. Um, they for my personality, um, they, as progressive vets they were, they were also not intellectually inclined. So um, they took me out of high school in my senior year and took me to Hawaii. Um, now I had been jumped a couple grades, so that's how I ended up being 16 with a high school diploma. Um, and I was extremely rebellious. Number one, because I missed my classmates. You know, I was only 16. <laughs> Second, because the revolution was happening in the Bay Area. What was I doing in Honolulu? <laughs> right? Um, I had no one to talk to, and there was nothing for me to do there. Those were the personal reasons why I became rebellious. But also, everything in in our lives was, I mean, my parents rebelled against their parents. My, f my mother's father married a ghetto Jew. That's, he comes from this very high class rabbinic family and he married a woman from Orchard Street who spoke Yiddish, Polish, Ukrainian, Russian, and no English, okay? So in each generation, there was full-scale rebellion. So it always surprised me that my parents would be upset. I think the other distance that opened up, and it's sad, it's a very sad thing for me, is that they didn't understand what higher education is about. And they did not understand why I would get a doctorate and they didn't understand what I wrote or why I wrote it. They never read anything that I wrote. Um, and they, I think they also, um, it was just a gap in communication. And that's a very sad part of my life that I was never able to bridge that gap. Um, they actually, <laughs> my parents wanted their children to be musicians. Now, one of my youngest sister is a, a musician. She lives in Europe, and she's a violist. She's very poor. <laughs> um, but 
they were, that's how they were. So, um, yes, um, that was a painful episode. I, I think it was difficult to do those things, but I think also um, it, it prepared me to, um, when I first went to China in 1980 to teach at Shanghai Shifan Dajue, um, it prepared me to meet my peers who had also had disrupted teenage years and who were hungry um, for intellectual life. I was always hungry um, to have an intellectual life. And when I was traveling as a young you know, teenager and worker, I, I read uh, novels about um, you know, the Mar Martha Quest series, for example. These were really important because the female figures, like Anna Wolf and so on, these were intellectuals and uh, engaged in uh, left-wing politics. Um, so that was the pathway that I wanted to follow. Mm. But I thought your parents would have loved you going to China. They, I think they... Um, my he himself wanted to go to Yan'an. <laughs> Exactly. I think by that time, he was very happy when I went to Taiwan to study Chinese. Very, very happy. And that's where I went in, uh, I was about 23, I think. And I have a wonderful picture. He's just so happy and proud. Um, but when it got to a doctoral program, it was as though, it's almost like a, a form of anti-intellectualism that that, you know, um, I'm not sure I really understand it, but there was kind of growing fear, I think, um, that they couldn't understand me or that I couldn't understand them. Um, and so we never resolved it. We just never did. Um, and I don't know why. I really don't. It's a it just, that's what happened, you yeah. Because uh, normally, yes. the parents would be most happy to see their children as doctors. Yeah. Would there be any gender issue in that? There's a huge would gender. You, uh, if yeah. you're a young man, and would that have been <laughs> I don't know. Kinchi, you know I wrote you an essay called, Before I Was Born, My Name Was Dirk. <laughs> I love the title, and I, I, some, when I retire, I'll write more about that. Absolutely. My father was a real chauvinist. He really believed that women were inferior. And this was the real, you know, of all the good things he did, this was the absolute worst. Um, and he, <laughs> um, he was very frank about it. He just felt that women were inferior to men. Uh, my sister made him a shirt, and she put... She embroidered MCP on the collar. <laughs> and my father said, oh, what is MCP? What does that mean? And she said, Daddy, you are a male chauvinist pig. He got really, really angry at her. It's a male chauvinist pig. She said, I love you, Daddy, but you really are. <laughs> so I think really the expectation was that, um, that our future would be to um, be very much in the mold of my mother, uh, who was a devoted spouse and um, an activist in her community, um, an educated woman, very bright woman, but really devoted housewife. And that was his norm. So um, I noticed that my father was very uneasy around women like my great aunt, who was a lawyer, and uh, my grandmother, who was a socialite. Um, so there was something about women in positions of authority that made him very uncomfortable. But it's good because that made, I think that was some kind of um, impetus yes. for you to really excel and be better than most men. I think that I can't discount that. I cannot discount that feeling of injustice. The injustice of having a father and mother that you love so much and all you want is for them to say, wow, we're really proud of you, you're a great kid. 
instead of all this nonsense about male and female and you know boys are better and oh my brother had four boys I just have four girls oh poor me it's like when my father was dying I went to visit him he had uh, cancer and it went to his brain so I remember so I went into his room and he said Tani how did you do it and I, rem I remember knowing exactly what he meant. I said, you mean, how did I become a success? He said, yeah, explain it to me. And then after I tried to explain what graduate school is, what it's like to write a book, um, how difficult it is to teach, why I travel so much, why I make these networks to, you know, to engage in critical studies. And then I said, um, well, what about you, Dad? You know, and he said, <laughs> he said, I've been a failure in my life. I, I was so shocked. I said, I knew what he meant. He meant, I've just been a school teacher all my life. But so I said, but dad, you know, you have four wonderful kids, all, you know, healthy and working hard. And he said, oh, that doesn't count. I thought, okay, <laughs> I know where I belong in this universe. So I said, Dad, why do you, what accounts for your failure in life? And he said, bad religion. So I didn't understand my father at all. In his mind, the Christian upbringing he had, had ruined his life. Now I think the politics was a way of overcoming the, the awfulness of that form of Christianity, um, the racist, classist, vulgar form of Christianity. Um, but you see, I w would never find out, and I was shocked when I heard that story. Yeah. Um, I think this was a constant tension in our household, and um, certainly because of the women's movement um, and the workers' movement, and so many of the movements that were going on in the United States. I was very much attracted to this ideology of autonomy and independence. Um, later, I think that's one of the serious reasons why I, I invested so much time and energy into learning um, about the Chinese case and, and learning and, and operating in, in Chinese circles was that, um, and I still believe this to be the case, um, the Chinese Revolution set a framework for women's movements all over the world. There is simply no way that you can come from my generation in the United States unaffected by the Chinese Women's Revolution. I thought that at the time and I still believe that to be the case. Um, and what was interesting I think about dealing with my with my own father was that this was a scenario played out all over the world. Reluctant fathers or fathers who didn't understand or who wanted to punish daughters who were disrespectful or in just requiring an autonomous life as a person with other people, not just husbands and sons. Um, that was a challenge that they had a lot of trouble overcoming. I can say that now that I'm much older, but at the time I was just very angry. Yeah. <laughs> mm. The anger is very constructive. I found it to be the case. The anger is, is also, um, when you and I were traveling together, I remember um, talking to the rural women and um, they, I told them that I had Chinese husband and, you know, that I had had some nasty encounters with Chinese family members. <laughs> um, and we found this ability to bind together with common experience. And I think um, the fact that I spent so many years inside a Chinese family, which is patriarchal, um, and I came from a patriarchal background. The changes in the lives of women um, uh, in the last hundred years, um, I think when we discuss these kinds of things together, we find a lot of commonalities. 
this, there, there is, the, the conflicts are very subtle because there's so much love involved, right? So you can love the people that are making your life difficult <laughs> or preventing me from getting a PhD, right? I had to work my way through my entire schooling. My parents never contributed and I never asked, um, but I loved them. So these are always, always the problems um, of constructive anger. I think also um, what, what these political investments mean is that, um, or for me, um, the need to, mm, to join with other people in these kinds of, of, of um, intellectual quests um, uh, particularly when I decided to become an editor and a publisher um, what I realized is how important it is to understand how strategy works so I think the powerful need for self-expression um, as an um, as a uh, um, growing into a form of womanhood that is politically comfortable and more liberatory um, it, the transmutation of of this sense of injustice this sense everyone can feel um, it's anger but it's also just confounding. It's like, what? You don't like me because I'm brown? You don't like me because I'm American? I'm female? I have blonde hair or brown, brown, dark, dark brown skin? This is the reason you, you don't like me? I can't believe it. I'm just a person. This kind of just profound misunderstanding, I, I just, I have to sit back and think, now why would people continue this way of thinking when <laughs> there's so many better ways to do it? Um, I think um, it's being blindsided. You desire to be like others and to be accepted and to accept others as peers in social, social and intellectual worlds. And when that doesn't happen, it's very frightening and angering. So the job that I think I, I have always sought is to clarify why that's not acceptable. It's just not acceptable. <laughs> mm. You've enjoyed so much uh, traveling in China. You've enjoyed so much editing the journal. Yes. And writing papers. I have, yeah. I just finished um, my second monograph. It's called um, In the Event of Women, and I make an um, uh, argument about um, uh, historical, um, how things happen historically, and use the case of the, the Chinese women's um, bursting into public life. But I do that using advertising and sociological theories, because people thought a lot about um, uh, what the liberation of women would mean in a developing country or a, a semi-colonial, coloni colonized country like China, um, intellectuals were very much concerned about re-theorizing society and social life, um, as were sociologists all over the world. But um, what's interesting and fascinating about working in Chinese materials is that um, intellectuals would bring problems into discussion, but not solutions. So they might read Montesquieu or Diderot or any number of, um, of socialist um, sociologists, um, evolutionary sociologists, and so on. And the problem that they were interested in was how do societies work? Now, they would take those generalizations from all over the world, often through Japan, and um, 
I, they wrote about what specifically that problem might mean um, for a revolutionary China, for a bourgeois China. Um, the sociology had many, many different components during the first half of the 20th century, late 19th century. Um, so um, the book uh, talks about what an event is um, and why um, people started thinking about the physiology of women, the psychology of women, the social life of women in a very, very new way. And this is a material process which goes along with um, commercial capital. So it's a funny argument and um, we'll see what kind of reception it gets. But it's allowed me investigating this sort of triangular relationship uh, between material production um, and the image of advertising, social theory, and um, uh, what the sort of the body of women. This has um, sort of completed the task I took on in my first monograph. Now that monograph was supposed to be called The Subject of Women in Chinese Feminism, but my publisher at that time would not allow me to use that title. And that's why the book is called The Question of Women in Chinese Feminism. Actually, the book is about how subjectivity is made in a literary sense. So it's very much influenced by Gayatri Spivak. It's a critique of Spivak, but it's also a review of how the subject women operates inside feminist theory. It's not a given. It's not a given that, <laughs> that a theory and a subject are going to be the same thing, or that a political subject, or just a human being, are going to identify as women inside a feminist theory. So that was my preoccupation then. I became more preoccupied with the conditions that led to these theories later on. I travel um, and have been traveling for years because I wanted to be involved in um, what I studied. So um, from the very beginning, um, uh, well, I think actually when I decided to found the journal was when I realized that work um, would have to involve me in meeting you, for instance. I believe that's how we met. Um, because um, I think Fred introduced us, and at the time I met you, you were uh, publishing a journal. And I remember very clearly, I, I think I still have copies of that journal. I remember where you were living and um, um, the conditions of your life then. But when I, um, when I began to form the journal Positions Asia Critique, um, I decided to ask around and find out what other journal projects in Asia were doing. Um, and so I remember going to Taiwan um, to talk to the radical sociology group there. Um, that's how I met Wang Hui. Um, I was introduced to him because he was the, the editor of Xue Zhe. So at the time we met, Liu He introduced us as, as editors. And um, that's how Wang Hui came to uh, visit us in San Francisco and we struck up an ongoing uh, relationship. So for me, um, uh, my work has always involved, um, or I'm an intellectual historian, so Intellectuals are my peers, and I, uh, I cannot simply study my peers as objects. <laughs> so one of the great pleasures in my career has been um, to talk and meet and consult with the people that I've written about in my work. Um, I think that this... Um, it's, it's immensely gratifying, but also um, uh, there are so many things that you cannot know. Uh, well, let me back up and say that I think that um, there are two things that have really shaped my understanding 
of Asian politics and the, li the life that I live when I'm here. Um, one of them is the work of the journal and um, talking to other intellectuals about common problems, philosophical problems, um, theoretical problems, problems of evidence. Um, and the other is living in a Chinese family, which um, taught me about uh, high degrees of conflict um, as a normal part of everyday life. Um, so, so I think these two things came together. Um, I gradually expanded as I looked for other progressive projects and journal um, journals um, immediately after the Cold War. There was um, foundation money that was given very liberally during those years to promote journals. And I remember attending a rather suspicious um, <laughs> meeting <laughs> um, in Hawaii, funded by some American whatever. And uh, there was a whole panel devoted to um, journals in Asia, intellectual journals, political journals, and so on. And there, there's where I met um, the first group of Indian intellectuals who have become uh, friends and associates. So I guess um, the travel was partly um, opened up by the collapse of Asian studies in American universities after the Cold War, the defunding of the old CIA-funded Cold War studies. Um, my own interest in connecting with the very people that, that we, I mean, we were collaborators, basically, doing very, very similar work from different national vantage points. Um, and also because um, I was very curious. I was simply very, very curious. And um, um, I, I have thought often, you know, um, from time to time about um, spending more time after I retire. One of the, um, I, I think you probably already know this, but one, some of the happiest times I've had were traveling with uh, the Peace Women. Um, that was extraordinary. And um, because my associations have always been with other intellectuals, it was truly the first time that I ever sat and talked with farm women um, and just listened to them. <laughs> um, also, um, it's through you that um, I have learned a great deal about the difficulties and challenges and um, incredible meaning that goes into um, organizing work. Um, on behalf of environmental movement, social justice movement, um, and poverty relief. So um, I was able, I think, um, to move and witness. Um, I was happened to be in Beijing when Wen Tiejun founded the James Yan movement. And I was there with Matthew. What is his other name? His <laughs> um, he was just beginning his education and I was translating for him. Now it'll be the other way around, I'm sure. He's been in, living in China for many years now. Um, but these were um, uh, intellectual events that were very meaningful to me. And I think you could even say very much in line with the way my parents brought me up. I remember we were in Inner Mongolia with yes. Ying Yuzhen, yes. and you were very emotional when Was you I? saw I, when you yeah. saw her, her writing her name. <sighs> yeah, and she's uh, well, she's have she's had um, difficulties in getting her children to continue her work because they prefer some other jobs, and but then she's continuing to plant trees. And uh, it's the, the, the small desert that we still saw on yes. our way to her farm, yes. we can't find it anymore. That's fantastic. <laughs> yes. I'll show you some more things about um, her building a pavilion. 
and there's a song uh, that she remembered by heart, of course. So she would be reciting this poem, and uh, I, I, I can imagine how you would react <laughs> because when you saw her signature, yes. uh, you were so touched, and so. If you hear her recite her song, uh, I, I recite the poem, and yeah, I, I can imagine. I remember it. that that um, we were going to go back there after Donald died, I think, but she had an auto accident, right? Did she recover? Yes. So she fully recovered. recovered. From that. Okay. And uh, yeah, she's had she's had many more plans. Yes. Yeah. And uh, last year we went back. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, with Lai also. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But then, uh, well, it would be good for us to go back if you have the, the opportunity. Well, let's go next year. Yes. I'll just plan on it because I would love to do that. Um, and those were extraordinary. I've never had an experience like that. Um, and, you know, when I tell people, um, I have taught the movie and pieces of the book. Um, from time to time and um, young people don't have this kind of experience much anymore. Times are much more desperate and the kind of students that I teach um, are more desperate than the usual kind of students because the financial expectation is so great. Um, so um, it's even more important I think um, to make sure they understand what the, um, how people struggle with different kinds of problems in different, you know, in places that they will probably never go. Um, but I can, I can show them that they could go there, right? There's nothing stopping them. Um, and that it's really important for them to know about this. So that would be fantastic if we could just do that. I'll